let's play make a deal this morning. I've got a dollar in my pocket, okay? I'll give a dollar to the first person who can pull a, pull a sweet and low packet out of their purse. Anybody got sweet and low in their purse? Anybody? Nobody has sweet and low? I'll accept Splenda. Nothing? All right. Stick of gum. Dollar for a stick of gum. Who's got a stick of gum? Show me a hand. Got one. All right. I really want some gum. Okay. All right. There you go. All right. What else? Let's see. Okay. Got, uh, got another dollar here. Let's see. Who has a library card? Who can show me a library card? Got a library card to show me? I'm, now, I'm not going to take your library card. Well, maybe I should. I need some books. All right. Is that a library card? Excellent. Okay, now, I, I can give you this dollar, or you can go for what's in my, my coat pocket. You want the dollar you see or what's in my coat pocket? All right. Two dollars. There you go. All right. We made a deal. All right. This one, I'm going to keep for myself. All right. Now, how many of you watched that show when it was on back in the day? Is it still on? I heard they, they revived it, you know. Is it any good? I loved watching it. I, I, loved, uh, I loved when you go in the audience and they show me a paper clip, a stick of gum, uh, who's got, you know, some crazy things in the wall, and they'd be amazing what they have, and they'd give money. And then the, the big prizes where they'd uh, bring out a car, right? And they'd say, you can have this car, or you can go for what's behind door number uh, two, right? And um, sometimes door number two was a better gift. Uh, sometimes door number three, or door number two was what they call zonkers, right? You remember some of the zonkers that people got? I remember one in particular, um, one of the Zonker Prizes was a, a trash can for every day of the week. They were, they were labeled Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way to Sunday. They were different colors. Now, as a kid, I thought that was pretty cool. I'd love to have that many trash cans and use a different one, there, but for an adult, I, I can see that was kind of bad. But uh, we, we make gambles every day like that, don't we? Make deals. You, you see something, but there's always the promise of something better. Maybe. You never know, right? We take chances. How many of you like taking chances? Nobody likes taking chances. Nobody likes taking chances? Not a one of you? Anthony, do you like taking chances? Yeah, he, he does. He's afraid. He's afraid to, to say in front of all y'all. You took a chance. And it paid off, didn't it? But see, I never made a promise that what was in here was better. What if my pocket was empty? Or what if, what if you didn't realize I put this stick of gum in my pocket and you would have just got a stick of gum instead of a dollar? But I put the, where is that gum? I already lost it. Oh, there it is. I better put it here before it melts. But, uh, but I didn't promise that there was something better in my pocket. She took a chance and it paid off. It was wide open. Now, some people think when it comes to trusting God, that's what it's like. It's a gamble. Who knows what's out there, you know? And God's just leading us along. But I want to show you that God doesn't just play around with you. He doesn't, he's not there to swindle you or give you zonkers. He is promising that there is something better. On the show like Let's Make a Deal, it's, it's anybody's guess. There's a 50-50 shot. You either are going to get something better or you're going to get something worse. But God has never left that to chance. He's never said, try it, let's make a deal. He has always said, what I have here is better than what's in your hand. Now, now you either have to believe that what he's saying is true, or you don't. And you be content with what you got, and you don't follow God. And that's exactly the spot that Abraham is in this situation. Um, if you recall, we looked at the first 11 chapters already uh, last year sometime. We saw the creation of the world. We saw the creation of man and woman. We saw 
um, the first family. We saw the first sin. We saw the first murder. We saw uh, a global flood where God judged the nations. And we saw um, the, the population expanding. We saw the world being populated. We saw their, their um, uh, selfish intent to make their name great, to forget who God was. We saw how he judged the world uh, after the flood by separating them into different people groups, different languages, so that they could not come together as one people and accomplish anything their heart desired. Why did God do that? Does he, hate that he, does he hate us? Does he not want us to succeed? No, but for our own good, he knows what we're capable of if we got together and, and accomplished our heart's desire. Our heart's desire is evil. And if we were allowed to accomplish it, we would destroy ourselves. God wouldn't have to do anything. We would destroy ourselves. So in His grace, He kept us from ourselves. He kept us from accomplishing those selfish, sinful desires, and He put a, he put a stop to us. And so now, the question is, what's going to happen? Because God made a promise in the garden when, when Adam and Eve sinned, and they were expelled from the garden, God still made a promise in His punishment of them. In his judgment, he still said, I'm going to correct this wrong. I'm going to make it right through the seed of the woman. We're tipped off right away. This is going to be Abram's story. Uh, the, 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 the saga of God keeping his promise to Adam and Eve of making things right is going to be told through the story of Abram. Uh, so, we're, so right away our mind is saying, okay, the, 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 the seed of the woman is going to come through this, this Savior, this man that God has promised is going to come through Abraham. But then we see the, the, um, the, the, um, the plot point, the, the, the conflict. Sarai, his wife, is barren. There are no children in Abram's family. How is God going to keep this promise? But in fact, God makes several promises to Abram. Uh, Abram, we learn through other parts of Scripture, his family, they were idol worshipers. They lived in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is uh, modern-day Iraq, around the Persian Gulf, far, far from Israel. And at some point, they, the family, uh, Abram and his father, the whole household, uh, left Ur and went uh, up north following the Mesopotamian River. Uh, they went up into Haran and settled there, uh, up, up north in Syria, uh, way far away. And then eventually, uh, at this point, when God calls Abram, he leaves Haran and comes down into Canaan, 400 miles from Haran down into the area of, uh, of Canaan, Shechem, Bethel, uh, these places. Stephen, in his sermon in Acts, tells us that, that Abram actually heard the call in Ur of the Chaldees, before they even went to Haran, God had already spoken to him, began to work on him. Uh, but we're, we're introduced to the story after they're already in Haran, and God gives these promises. He says to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house to a land I'll show you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you, and I'll make your name great. In these promises, we can see uh, not only God uh, moving his story, uh, progressing into the, the fulfillment of, of his promise, but we also, as Christians, we understand where this story eventually leads. We understand that it leads to Jesus Christ. Uh, because through Abraham's family all the way down uh, to the birth of Christ, he was keeping his promise, keeping his line uh, clean and pure, and, and, and the Messiah came through that line, and he, was in, and, uh, he grew up, and he became our Savior. He lived a righteous life, a sinless life. He died a perfect, spotless sacrifice for us. He rose from the dead, and he's at the right hand of the Father today. We, we have inherited those blessings in Christ today, and we can, we can praise God for that. That's why we're here. We're worshiping because we are uh, the seed of Abraham, the seed of faith. Uh, we're not physical uh, descendants of Abraham, but we're spiritual descendants because we had the faith that Abraham, uh, Abraham had. Some see this, uh, this story here 
as a, uh, as a typical call to missions, to, to get up and just go and spread the gospel. Now, Abraham wasn't told to go spread any gospel. Now, the gospel uh, is evident in, his, in this promise, and it's evident in, in uh, the, the story as it points us to Christ. Just the, the thought of Abraham say, being told that he's going to be a blessing, or he's going to be blessed, and he's going to be a blessing. Uh, we have received the blessings of God, and we're to take those and be a blessing. That is, that is the Christian life in a nutshell. We're blessed by God, and we turn around and we bless others with what God has blessed us with. Um, some uh, authors call that top line and bottom line blessing. The top line blessing is, is that we've got it from God. The bottom line is we give it out. And nowhere is that more evident than in the gospel itself. The, the blessing of eternal life, the blessing of forgiveness of sins that we've got in Jesus Christ, we have received all that. And now we turn and we dispense it. As recipients, we become dispensers. We become uh, those who go out. So in that sense, every one of us is a missionary. Some have gone so far as to say this is the first appearance of the Great Commission. You ask where the Great Commission is, you're going to turn to Matthew or, or Mark or Luke or John. But Genesis 12 could be seen as the first instance of the Great Commission to, to take what you've received and go and share with others. But what we see really is God beginning to restore and to reconcile humanity with himself, to reveal himself. In those first 11 chapters, we see the knowledge and understanding of God um, fading. The knowledge of God is very strong in the Garden of Eden. It was strong with Adam and Eve. It was strong with Cain and Abel, even though uh, Cain disobeyed. Uh, there was no question that Cain knew who God was and knew what he was capable of doing, even in, as he rebelled. But in the time of the flood, when everybody was uh, pursuing evil thoughts, they were uh, the living for themselves, uh, there was no concerted, um, evident knowledge of God. After the flood, things looked a little bit hopeful, but it didn't take long for it to devolve again into uh, selfish, worldly, man-centered thinking. So God is trying to restore that. See, he had, he had uh, expelled man from, from the land that he created. He created this, this garden for them. Because of their sin and rebellion, he, he expelled them and he sent them away. And then in the flood, he wiped them out. And then as the population grew after the flood and they came together to pursue evil thoughts, he scattered them away even further, spread them out. But now we start to see God bringing things to himself again. He starts with one man. He starts with Abram. He says, go forth. He says, leave, come out of your country, come out of your, come out of your family, come out of your house, come to me. I'm gathering you for my name. I'm making a people for my name. I'm revealing myself to the world. The world has forgotten me. The nations are worshiping other gods. They're pursuing other philosophies. They have, they're inventing other stories of how the world began. They have turned their back on me. They don't know who I am. And the only way they'll know is if I reveal myself. So I'm starting with you, Abram. I'm revealing myself. So come to me. Discover who I am. And let the world know who I am through your actions, through your obedience, through your life. And ultimately, the world will know the ultimate revelation will be Jesus Christ. There's no better revelation of God than Jesus Christ, who has explained through his, uh, his earthly ministry, who taught us the righteousness of God, taught us the will of God, uh, gave us a visible image of God as he walked and then told us how to be saved. But in the meantime, God is revealing himself. And Abram was an example of trust. He was told to go somewhere he had never gone before, to do something he had never seen. In essence, 
God was saying, let's make a deal. See, Abram was well off. He had a good family. Yes, his wife uh, was barren. They had no children, but he had a, a good-sized family. He was very wealthy. And God says, I've got something better for you. You're, you're, you're familiar with the land you're living in. You've been there a while. You know the place. You've, you've, got, you've got roots here. But what I've got behind door number two is better. See, he didn't say to Abram, take a chance. Maybe it's better. And he didn't even say, really, that you had to leave everything behind. Uh, Abram took his wealth with him, and he accumulated more. But God was saying, there's something behind that first step that you can't see. But I see it, and I'm telling you it's better. So are you going to follow me and see for yourself, or are you going to deny me and stay where you're at? And so uh, as we want to be people of faith and trust like Abram was, I want to show you what we're called to go forth to, if you dare. And, and we, we can be scared of propositions like this, that somehow a message like this is telling us that we've got to just leave it all behind and go somewhere, to go be uh, preachers or missionaries, to, to just get up. And I'm not challenging anybody to doing that today, unless that's specifically what you know God is calling you to do. But I'm calling everyone, as we look at the Word Seeing the word calling everyone has to understand that we must trade something for what God has for us. To be able to let go of things we know so that we can receive what God has for us. We're told to go forth to a better land because God promises a better land. God absolutely promises a better land. He tells he tells Abram <clears throat> to go forth <clears throat> from your country. Go forth from your country. And he follows that with a promise to a land which I will show you. And he's talking about Canaan initially. Physically, he's talking about the land of Canaan. And we know that that promise will be fulfilled later on in the Old Testament when the, when the Israelites come out of Egypt and they go to possess the land after they cross the Jordan under Joshua's leadership. And so he's saying, this country you're in, this physical land where you're raising livestock and you're raising, uh, uh, you, you've got a marriage and you've got uh, your young nephew Lot and you've got this family, you are, you are enjoying your days in this land, you feel pretty secure. But I've got something better for you, he says. So he's called to, to, to let go of those ties, to not find security in the physical place where he resides, but take, take a, seriously God's promise of better security, a better land, a better place, a better habitation. And that's what he's calling us to do today. So we, we have in our lives, we live in a land of security, of peace, of freedom. We, we live in a land where we enjoy private property. Most of us do. It's ours. And we can proudly say, keep off the grass, no trespassing. And we, we secure our homes, we secure our land, because that's our right. But as adults, we should know that no matter how secure we try to make something, there's always a danger. There's always a danger that that can all wash away, isn't there? It can all wash away. Someone will always dare to cross that line, to breach the wall, to break and enter, to take what's yours and make it their own. There's the danger there. If there was no danger, we would never put walls up to begin with, would we? 
but we're very aware of the danger. And we try, sometimes successfully, sometimes futilely, to secure it. But God is teaching us, as we walk with God, He teaches us and shows us that we don't have the power over our own security. We don't know what's beyond the wall. We don't know what's beyond the next day. And if we dwell on it too much, we will be afraid. But God is offering us security. He has something more everlasting than a house, than a land, than a, than a car, than a, than a wall, than a fence, than a gate. Something more secure. And it's his protection. And it's his land. We talk about heaven. We're going to die and go to heaven. We wonder what it's going to be like up there. And, and, and there's a lot of things we just don't have answers to. We can speculate. Uh, we can imagine clouds. We can imagine angels and harps. We can imagine sunlight. We can imagine rainbows and pretty flowers. We can imagine all kinds of things. But the Bible makes it clear that there's a difference. There's a, there's a, there's a transition from the moment we leave this body and, and enter into the presence of the Lord, we call that heaven. But there's a time coming in the eternal state when the Lord does return and he makes everything new and whole. He redeems the entire created world, the universe. We're told about uh, a heaven on earth. We're told about a, a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem, this heavenly city. It's a physical place. And we're in our physical resurrected bodies, always in the presence of the Lord. But there's land there. And I believe that God is preparing our hearts for that as he gives this promise to Abraham. He initially gave a promise of this land of Canaan. This is a, a very... Um, much desired piece of land that countries and peoples, nations have warred over and still war over today, don't they? They still fight for this land. And we get ourselves glued to the news channels and newspapers and we want to see what's going on in that land as if it affects us somehow. But know this, the promise that we have from God is even better than that. Our promise is not wrapped up in that real estate over there. The land that's promised us is the eternal state, the, the new heaven and new earth that, he's, that is coming at the resurrection. That's the land we're looking forward to. And you can read Revelation, the final chapters, and see the description of that. And you understand that that is secure. God will see to it that nothing breaches those walls. You see about the, the evildoers, the dogs, the murderers, the liars, the whoremongers, the idolaters. None of them are allowed into the city, are they? They will never enter. And that is a promise from God. He's saying, go forth. Let go of the security. Let go of the security of, of America. Let go of your, uh, your interest in uh, Palestine. Let go of all your concerns about what's happening in the physical world. I don't mean that you just, uh, just check out completely. But understand that, that your efforts to secure for yourself a good life being wrapped up in the physical land is useless when you compare it to what God has promised of the eternal life and His presence at the resurrection. God promises a better land than you have ever seen. And he promised Abram a better land than he had ever seen, and he showed it. Abram went, and he saw it with his own eyes. Now, we know that he never uh, possessed it, but his children did. His children did. God kept a promise. And if he kept a promise for Abram, he kept a promise for us. He also says to go forth to a better family. God promises a better family. Abram had a, a very good family. At least, you know, he didn't complain about it. But he had a father named Terry. He had brothers. He had a wife. He had uh, nephews. He had um, uh, this, this structure. He had 
fellowship with his family. I'm sure they loved each other, and they looked out for each other. I bet it, it, it uh, I know they didn't have Christmas back then, but at birthdays and holidays, I'm sure there was a lot of, uh, a lot of good times at the dinner table. There were a lot of gifts being given. They, 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 uh, uh, they took care of each other. There's a, there's a sense of security there, too. We love our families, don't we? We look forward to those times together, especially if you spread out. But those of you who enjoy a day-to-day time living on the same land and uh, being able to just walk to their house and, and to see the grandkids grow, that, that is a fantastic life to have, isn't it? It's a blessing. It's a joy. But as joyful and as blessed as that is, God promises something better than that. And see, Abram needed a promise like that because he, was not have, he did not have children. And so he watched, and his wife watched the siblings, the, the, the brothers-in-law and the sisters-in-law. They were having kids and raising them, and they were watching them grow and seeing the smiles on their faces. And Abram and Sarah, all they could see in their future was nothing, just, just an empty tent. God says, I am going to give you a better family. He says, leave your relatives, leave, leave your family, and I will make you a great nation. See, families became nations. As a patriarch, Terah was a patriarch, and his children would have children, and their children would have children, and so they would expand and multiply, and they would become a nation. And God says, Abram, you're going to be that nation. You're not going to be of the nation of Terah. You're going to be the beginning of the nation of Abram, uh, which we know biblically as Israel, after his grandson Jacob. See, Abram had never seen that. He didn't have a child that he could even hope to dream about that. But God says, you're going to have it. Some of us grow up in small family units. Some of us grow up in large family units. Some of our uh, fathers and grandfathers were business owners or uh, they were well known and, and you've inherited that legacy. Some of you have none of it. And the question is, what will you do? Will you rely on that legacy? Will you, will you bask in that? Will you, will you uh, enjoy uh, the reputation that comes from that and just coast in that? Or will you follow God into his family? He's saying, he's saying to Abram, come out of your family. Don't rely on that security. Don't rely on that legacy. Don't rely on that income. Come to me, and I will make you great. And he did. We know the promise was kept because he had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They went down to Egypt, came out uh, a million or two strong, uh, inhabited the land of Canaan, uh, became the nation of Israel. We know God kept his promise. Now, I'm not saying that God is promising that if you come out of your family, he's going to turn you into a nation. That's not the promise. But the promise is that you're, you're becoming in following him if you don't rely on the success of your earthly family and you trust God and follow Him into His family, the family of God, you understand the legacy that's there. You understand the income, the wealth that's there. We understand the blessing. You understand the, the, uh, the support system that's there. Jesus' disciples um, said, we have left everything to follow you. We left our jobs. They... Remember Peter and John and, uh, and James and Andrew? They, they just dropped their fishing nets and got out of the boat and followed Jesus with no idea where they were going. They left their dad behind. They left the family business. Peter said, we've left it all. Jesus says, none of you, no one has left father, mother, mother, brother, sister, family, who won't get it replaced a hundredfold. Because you, in following God, you enter something so much more. The family of God. The church. You have, right around, you have mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, children all around you. You are connected in Christ. You are a family. And you would not really have that outside of Christ. 
Oh, there's community out there. But you know what community is like. You know what a community is like when Christ isn't the center, don't you? It's distrust. It's locked doors. It's locked gates. It's closed blinds. But in the church, in the family of God, it's open, isn't it? Or it should be. I challenge you, is, it, is your life as open as it ought to be in the family of God? Where your Christian brothers and sisters can approach you confidently? Where your, your spiritual children, your spiritual parents, your, uh, all this, this is a family. And Abram was saying, you, you leave the family you know to a family I'm going to create for you, and you won't be disappointed. And the same thing is there for us in Christ. You, you, uh, you don't rely on the, the family you know. Come into the new family. Jesus said in very strong words, but he says, unless you hate your father or mother and love me, you're not part of me. Now, he's not teaching you to, uh, to really hate your parents. But he's saying your love, your devotion to Christ should be so strong that, that what, you, what you feel for your parents looks like hate. And you can, you can, uh, you can just uh, love your parents to death. And you can st- stay with them and hug on them and everything, but your devotion to Christ much, looks so much better than that that even your, your hugs for your parents and your love for your parents looks like hate compared to Christ. That's what we've been called to do. That's a promise that he has shown. and It's a promise he's keeping. And finally he says uh, to go forth. Go forth to a better inheritance. God promises a better inheritance. And that ties in with the whole family thing, but, but he says, um, leave your father's house. Not only leave your relatives, but leave your father's house. And he says, in, a, in, in that sense, you leave your father's house, and I will bless you. See, in that economy, in that, in that culture, blessing came from your father's house, the inheritance. When your father died, what did he leave you? What he left you was the blessing, the wealth. Because even then they knew you can't take it with you. I was talking to a, a buddy who works at the funeral home and he was telling me some of the crazy things he's heard people be buried with. He, he said the one particular person was, uh, I guess the, I might have the particular details wrong, but, the, but this person liked playing, let's say they liked playing bridge. And they were, this person was embalmed sitting at a card table with a, with a, a bridge hand clasped in their fingers. And they put that in a, a vault and buried it. I've heard of people being uh, buried on tops of motorcycles, in cars. You can't take that stuff with you. And fathers know they can't take their wealth with you. And if they have any regard for the children, they'll leave it for them. And I'm sure Tara had quite an inheritance uh, set aside for his children. God says, you come come out of there. You go forth, you follow me, and I have a better inheritance promised for you. Something better than your dad can ever give you. I'll be your father, and I have a blessing. I have an inheritance. And we know the Bible speaks all through about the inheritance. The, The New Testament talks about our inheritance. And it's not something that we take with us, it's something that's waiting for us when we get there. So you can leave it all behind. And you will enter into the furnished presence of the Lord. Now we know uh, God's promise to Abram wasn't just spiritual. God really blessed him with physical, material wealth. And it's evident he was very wealthy. But the the guarantee is not for us that we who follow Christ will enjoy material wealth in our life. That's not a promise. Now, preachers, will there are are those out there trying to teach you that. Uh, But that's not a promise. Uh, There is enough evidence in Scripture that that's not the case for every follower of God. But the physical wealth that Abram received uh, tells us 
that God does keep his promise, and we have a promise of the spiritual riches of the kingdom waiting for us. Now, God has just revealed himself to Abraham. He says, this is me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm your, I'm a, I'm a heavenly father that I love the people. I have blessings for you. I have inheritance. I have a land, a place prepared for you. This is me. This is my character. I know the first, the first part of the story of Genesis has been about God dispensing judgment, of, of uh, disciplining his people. But, the, but that is God's character. But his character is also one of love. He wants to restore what was lost in the garden. He wants to reconcile the relationship that was damaged. And so he's revealing it to Abraham, I want a relationship with you. He's not just a cloud of blessing reigning indiscriminately. He is a relational God. And he says to Abram, I have these for you. But listen to this. Abram, you must go forth. You must leave all this to receive all this. And Abraham obeyed. You see the pattern. He says, in verse 4, Abram went forth. In verse 5, it says they set out. In verse 6, they passed through and they came as far as Shechem. Verse 8, they proceeded. In 9, they journeyed. Uh, Abram was going where God told him to go. Wherever he led, Abram followed. And in the midst of that, we see Abram worshiping. I really don't know why uh, we see these stages of Abram's journey. Why did he stop here and then go a little further? Um, I don't think it was hesitation. But he, he went as far as Shechem. And while he was there, God appeared again. He says, to your descendants I'll give this land. And right on the spot, Abram built an altar. He worshipped. See, God had revealed that he's a relational God. And Abram showed that he was, he was in this relationship. He was eager for it. He worshipped this God. He gave honor. We don't know what uh, all went on this altar. Was it just an altar of prayer? Was there a sacrifice made? Most altars... Uh, described in the Old Testament, um, it goes without saying that there were um, sacrifices made. There were animals uh, slain and offered to God. But he built an altar, and then he went on, and he went to the mountain between um, Bethel and I, and there he built another altar, and he called on the name of the Lord. He called on the name of the Lord. This wasn't just a generic offering to an impersonal deity. It wasn't just a uh, desperate uh, grasp for something he couldn't see. This was his acknowledging that uh, this wasn't luck, this wasn't hard work, this wasn't uh, anything other than a gift from Yahweh who made himself known to him. So Abram called on his name. He said, you're Yahweh. You're the God who is. You're the God who appears. You're the God who provides. You're my God. And everything I have came from you, and everything I have is yours. So we see the start of a beautiful relationship. A relationship that's available to every one of us here. Most of you know what it's like already. But if you don't, if you haven't grasped it, I want you to know it's available. The Scripture makes it very clear. The relationship that God has inaugurated with Abram is available to all of us, and it's available because of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who presented Himself holy and blameless to the Father and became our sacrifice. And now you have a way to God, a way to a relationship that was not possible. It wasn't possible because of your sin. God's revealed himself. He's a relational God. He's a restoring God. And if you don't know what it's like to be restored and reconciled to God, if God is still, uh, if the thought of God makes you miserable, if he's still 
uh, if you feel fearful, if you're afraid of his judgment, then your relationship's not what it needs to be. And I, I invite you, I implore you, I beg, come to this God who has said, go forth and I will show you. You know what you have. You know what's in your hand. You know what you possessed. What God has is greater than what you possess. And if you haven't got sight of that, if you haven't tasted that, come today and receive what he's promised.